Buenas noches, mi gente. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us back on our regular night at our regular time. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see a lot of familiar faces in the chat. As you can see in front of you, my guest tonight is a very familiar face. Um, you cannot be on the internet and not know Miss Livria Jones. I, I, no, <laughs> uh, no, that is the truth. <laughs> and and to call you the queen of remote work, that is not hyperbole. That is not an overstatement. That is who you are. So Aww, well, thank you. very happy to have you here tonight. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think like, I haven't done this. It feels like I haven't done this in a while because <laughs> I was traipsing all over Europe. Um, so yeah, I'm supposed to welcome y'all. And if you are new here and you're like, I know Libria, but I don't know who the hell that other chick is. My name is Adelia Borishade. I am the founder of Picky Girls Travel Solo, which is a Facebook group specifically for uh, creating a space for black female solo travelers to network. Doesn't matter how old you are, how new to the game you are, or if you are an OG solo traveler, um, we welcome you to the group. I am also the founder of the Financial Confidence Academy, which is a space where I help women like you figure out their finances, get their money together so that they can live the life of their dreams. Um, that's kind of what I've been doing for the last six years. I live currently in Mexico City, my most favorite place in the world. <laughs> and I mean, it is. I just had that conversation again today and I spend my time doing, th I, can, I can honestly say that I spend my time doing things that bring me joy. Yeah, so I love that. if you're into solo travel, you're thinking about maybe moving abroad or you're like, girl, my money is not right and I need some help. You are in the right place. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel. You turn on notifications so that when I go live like I am tonight or when I upload a new video, you are one of the first people to know. OK, um, before we start because I know this is going to be a question. We are going to have a follow up to the little <laughs> <laughs> Scandinavian adventure. Um, I This week has been very busy and uh, I got a hot date this weekend. Oh, oh. so. So <laughs> I can't I can't get, gather my thoughts to do to give y'all part two, but part two will be next week. So in case you came here tonight wondering about how all that turned out, next week I came we'll here tonight wondering how that turned out. <laughs> I, I want to know about this hot date. That's what I'm here for. Yeah, I mean, um, that's that's gonna be interesting. You didn't mention that in our talking points. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's get to it. Um, as I mentioned, everybody knows Libria because of the, uh, yes, they do, the evangelism that she does for remote work. How long have you been working remotely? Um, first off, thanks for inviting me. This is the first time we're doing this, which is wild. I know. Um, also, secondly, it was so nice to meet you in person at yes. No Madness Festival. It was nice to see your face, put my arms around you, laugh with you, all that good stuff. So thanks for being out. Also. Help, help the introverted introvert out <laughs> <laughs> and Girl. keep her from being too socially awkward. Much appreciated. She walked, up, she walked up at one event with this look on her face. <laughs> like, I don't, don't talk to me, anybody. And, and I was, was like, trying. Well, and she was like, I'm attempting to be social. I was like, that's not what your face says, friend. <laughs> you get an F today. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, I have been working remotely off and on for 13, over 13 years. So my first remote job was in 2008, 2008. So this was like way before the pandemic, way before digital nomad was a thing, way before people thought that folks could actually get remote jobs. I mean, I didn't even know until I got one. Um, and I've been telling people how to get remote work since 2015. So I've been I've been on this evangelism 
since 2015. People are now paying attention because they're like, oh, she wasn't playing. This is real. <laughs> um, but I've been I've been helping people land remote work or at least sharing resources about remote work since 2015. And from what I have observed, um, you've really leveraged your remote work to kind of still be able to travel, still be able, you know, to do the things that you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, a lot of the women I talk to on this channel um, have either moved abroad or um, maybe have plans to. And one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you was because you hadn't gone that route. That's just one of the many, many reasons. Um, so, you know, I think sometimes when people think remote work, um, maybe, I guess, I don't know. I think they think the jobs kind of fall into two categories. Either it's going to be very low pay, um, administrative work, or it's like you hit the jackpot, you get a job, a remote job in tech. Mm -hmm. And where did you fall? Um, well, I mean, I think people think that less now, thankfully, than they did before. But that was the challenge that I always had with people, you know, again, trying to sh spread this word since 2015. People thought you had to be uh, in tech. You either didn't get paid. I even thought that. I, even though I had worked remotely, right? Because my initial foray into working remotely was customer service, which is great. I'm glad I did it. I will never not customer service. And I love that I can always, at any point in my life now, get a job in customer service because I've done it before. Um, but I was working as a project manager and had you know, finally hit the six figures. I was all proud. Like I got my little six figure salary. Hey, <laughs> you know, first generation college graduate. And I have finally hit six figures. I'm very excited. And one of my homeboys was like, you should come work for my company. They hire PMs to work remotely. And I was like, ain't no way. Somebody finna pay me six figures to do this work in my PJs. Like, there's just no way. This was back in 2014, 15. And so I just ignored him for like six months. I was like, sir, I'm gonna sit here and collect this check. My, and, and my commute was only 10 minutes at the time, which if any of you have ever lived in Atlanta, you know is that's why I've driven in Atlanta. So I know. Jackpot. My commute was only 10 minutes. I actually liked my coworkers. Um, I had a management position, so I was developing people and I was working on really great projects. I had really good report work. So it was like, I don't want to take a pay cut just to, you know, win 10 minutes back. And at some point I was like, well, I want to start this travel business, right? I took a group of people around the world for a whole year and I wanted to start this business and I needed to invest time in myself, which meant I need all of my time back and I need to not be sitting in an office having to look busy when I'm not. I want to be able to work on my business stuff without someone walking by my desk and looking like, girl, what is you doing? And I got to get back to my TPS reports. You know what I'm saying? So I decided that like I was making an assumption. So let me ask. <laughs> let me just ask. And I asked him, I was like, what's the range um, for project managers? And <laughs> the range was more than I was making. <laughs> so I was wrong. I was so wrong. And so what I challenge people is whatever assumption that you're making about remote work, ask yourself, is it true? The truth is you don't know. You have no idea. And the last thing I want to say is people are so afraid of being in tech. And I love to remind people that tech is not just for technical people. I've been working in the tech space for 10 years now and I am not technical. So the cool thing about being in tech is you think developers and software engineers but guess what? Those people cannot do their own finances. They do not do their own recruiting. They don't do their own legal. They don't do their own project management. They don't do their own HR. So they need all of these non-technical people, even to run tech companies. And we're in a space now where every company is pretty much a tech company at this point. Okay. Now, there's something you said. You, you know, you, you did customer service. You got into project management. Mm -hmm. You broke that that ceiling of six figures. But yet we're here tonight to talk cool. about maybe not having the money one hopes to retire with. And so at first listen, it sounds like those two things don't go together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let, 
I ain't trying to have you put all your business in the streets. I'm but, a very transparent person. Okay. okay. Ask yeah. me anything. And if it's too much, I'll say, I'm not going to tell you that. Okay. And I will tell you this. Okay. <laughs> so I will just say this as somebody who was a woefully underpaid public school teacher where six figures was never, ever going to happen for me. It is, it is a surprise for me to hear and to see somebody as successful as you talk about, yeah, it doesn't look like I've got the money I need to retire with. Yeah. Yep. So, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, what, how would you rate your, your money habits? <laughs> it's so funny. Me and this guy were, we were playing this little dating game where you like pull out these cards and ask questions. And one of the questions was, if you didn't make another dime, how long could you live on the money that you have? And I was like, I don't know, about 45 minutes, an hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the real answer, thank God. But it's not a great one either. Like the actual answer is not great. I'd say probably maybe six months to a year, maybe, if I didn't make another dime. Um, and so I think part of the challenge is people see folks that make a lot of money or make, you know, over six figures and you automatically assume this person is probably financially set. And my challenge is I have had very poor financial habits for most of my life. And a lot of times we try to fix that by earning more money, which is one way to fix it. But the truth is you cannot out earn bad financial habits. Just like you can't, you can't out train bad eating habits, right? Yes. You yes. can go to the gym all you want to, but you eat donuts and Taco Bell, like it's just not going to work out for you, <laughs> right? You have to have both. And, you know, I follow this young lady who I love, um, Money Boss Mama on Instagram. She talks a lot about how she got out of debt. Uh, she's a single mom, has two kids, low sal, like not a high earner. And she still got out of debt. Tiffany Budgetnista, like her story of being a school teacher and being able to pay off debt and increase her credit. So one of the things that me and Diana, uh, Dana of, of Money Boss Mama talked about was the fact that it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you have good financial habits, right, then you're already setting yourself up for success. And quite frankly, I wish I had fixed my habits before I got this bag because one, it's like the bag had a hole in it <laughs> when I got it. It did. It did. It did. It basically had a hole in it. And two, my bad habits cost me more now. Like once I got more money, those bad habits cost way more than they oh, did. Absolutely. I was making 25K a year in customer service. You know what I mean? So yeah. It's so, different. so let's talk about what are some of those bad habits that you had? I'm a Libra, so I'm very indulgent. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think the other thing is too, a lot of us. You know, we talk about this all the time, how a lot of us grew up in households where we didn't talk about money and it wasn't, these things weren't modeled to us, right? And no knock on our parents because it wasn't modeled to them either. And they didn't even know they were supposed to be teaching us this, right? They had no idea that they were supposed to be teaching us this in most cases. And so I, I just think that part of this comes from growing up in an environment where you know, <laughs> I don't want to out my parents, but you know, we lived in a trailer. We had a whole bunch of cars. Like this doesn't this doesn't match up, right? Now, my mother is actually really good with money, but she didn't share any of that with me. So all I saw was the spending. Because there's there's two things there, and the yeah. one is, and this is not just a knock on our parents. This is a, a very American thing that yeah. you don't talk about money. Yeah. You're supposed to look like you have plenty of it. Yeah. And you really are supposed to do whatever it takes to look that way. Yeah. But you're never supposed to have conversations about how much money is there? Where's the money coming from? How are we choosing? You're never supposed to talk yeah. about it. You're not, you're not supposed to talk about, well, how much do people make? Oh, yeah. And, so, and <laughs> yeah, me and my best friend were just talking about this. Like you have we have to be having these conversations, if not with the whole world, at least have them with your peer group, have them with your friends. My best friend has now started making over six figures for the first time in her whole career. Didn't think she could because she and I talk about money and how much I make and how I, I was pushing her like you need to go into fight. You need to go into the tech space. 
find a job at a tech company. She works in PR. Girl, she making good money now. Okay. But. <laughs> now, as a public employee, how much money I made was public record. You yep. go to any school district's yep. website, you say, this person has this many years, this is how much they make. Yep. And I knew I was underpaid, but it wasn't until I got into spaces with women who were sharing that, that I found out the kind of money people are like, I'm like, they pay you how many hundreds of thousands of dollars to do yep. that? I had no, no idea at all. Yeah. I will say, so my... I have coworkers that know how much I make and I know how much they make. Um, one is a white male, one is a black male. Like we talk about these things. Um, and But we don't just talk about like how much we make, we talk about what our goals are, right? And so we kind of created this little group where we push each other. Um, my close friends know how much I make and the person that helps me negotiate my salary, she knows how much I make. And whenever I talk to people who are really trying to get into project management, I tell them like kind of where to start and and where we land so that people know what to expect. But I will tell you to answer your question directly, um, some of the mistakes that I constantly make or have made over the years that I think have not put me in a good position to be able to retire are things like, girl, this is gonna be real bad. So I'm gonna keep, I said I was gonna keep it 100 with y'all. <laughs> so if you have been sitting around feeling bad about some of the decisions you make, just know that you're not the only one, right? Um, and it doesn't mean that you're not smart. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. Plenty of smart people make a lot of dumb decisions. It just is what it is. So one, this is really bad too. I have literally, every time I left a job, taken out my 401k rather than leave it in. Oh my. Let me, you, let me make it worse for you. Let me make it worse for you. I used to administer 401ks. My first real job was at a benefits company I worked in customer in the customer service department, got promoted to a manager, and then got promoted to their 401k department. And I used to get people to sign up for 401ks and I would administer their 401ks and educate people on 401ks. So I know better. So when I think about this is over, so my daughter's 19. This is over a 19-year career. I have literally taken out my 401k every time I left a job versus roll it over. What the hell? Who let me do that? Okay, first of all. You are not alone in doing Yeah, that. I know I'm not. And because and, there's a lot of people who, who are just like, well, that's what you do. Not realizing that that one thing basically adds what? I, I don't even know how many years, how many decades. I don't even want to do the math on no, this. No, and I have I am not a math person. I, uh, I, I am a math but, person. I don't want to do the math on this because I don't need to be in, in the depression. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not a math person, but I know enough to know it's a really big number. Yeah, that doing that cost you like this is 19 years. Yes, and even even if I wasn't maxing out my 401k, I was putting, I always put something in it. Any if any job I've had that had a 401k, I put something in it, right? Um, and as I started making more, it was I'm going to put the the minimum at the very least. I'm going to put the minimum to get the maximum match because that's yes. free money. Right. I teach people this. I used to yes. teach people this. I used to write articles about it. You like, don't leave my, money on the table. You don't leave money on the table. And then I would leave and it would be like, do you want to roll this over? I'd be like, nope, cut me a check. So here and here's the problem. If you don't know what that means, one, that means that, that money is no longer earning anything. That's problem number one. That's problem number one. <laughs> problem number two, I now have to pay taxes on that. And a penalty. And a penalty. you are not 59 and a half. I show then, length, not even close. And then additionally, you've lost the time in the market. And that's the thing that is really your friend. Years. 19 Yes, years. yes. So, okay, so that's a mistake. That's one mistake. Um, mistake number two is I am not a saver. I have been, I literally have always created a savings account, put money in it and take money out. That is, that's, if you are, if you are guilty of doing that, please say, drop a me too so, in the comments. So, so many I don't feel people alone. are guilty of that. So many people are like, I, they're, Adelia. So my daughter is a saver and I'm trying to teach her to be a saver. I keep telling her, I tell her all the stupid things that I've done in my life. And that's, that's great. That's great. Even she's like, really? You did that? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, girl, I sure did. I'm glad you know that's stupid. <laughs> Um, she has literally not gotten one paycheck that she didn't save. 
she didn't save money from. She saved something. Even if she only makes $100, she's going to save 50, right? She'll save something. Um, and there was a point where she had more in savings than I did. And I was like, girl. So anyway, <laughs> so that's mistake number two, not, not being a saver and always taking money out of savings. Um, here's a big mistake that I continue to kick myself for. <laughs> so I worked at the Home Depot and we got stock options. Not only when we first got there, but every year we got additional stock and you could buy stock in the company at a 15% discount. So that's already a bonus right there, right? That's already an uptick. That's technically basically you could buy it. free money. That's basically that's free money. And technically when you buy the stock, they buy it like the last day of the quarter. So technically you could sell it the next day and make 15% just because of that, right? Anyway, when I left the Home Depot, I cashed out. Let me, let, let me make this worse. When I started working at Home Depot, I want y'all to somebody look up, somebody open another window, look on your phone or whatever. Look up the Home Depot stock price right now and drop that in the comments. Just do me that favor right quick. Somebody, somebody drop, drop the Home Depot stock price in the comments before I tell y'all this. Who, who, who got the fast fingers? I don't, I can't remember how much stock. I oh, had. girl. I can't, I, I don't remember how oh, much stock. Oh, my had. God. Somebody, somebody drop it. I see it. You see it? Somebody drop it in the comments. Holy, Look up the Home Depot stock shit. price and drop it in the comments. I'm not going to, let me. <laughs> okay. Somebody said the current stock price is 282.19. Uh, when I that's started, not the number I'm seeing. What a number are you seeing? Oh, it's giving it to me in pesos. Okay. <laughs> Because I was like, holy down. shit. Bring it down. So 282 is a little bit lower than it was a couple weeks ago. It was like in the 300s. When I started working at Home Depot and they awarded me stock, my first few, my first year there, the stock price was $22. Okay. $22. Let me, let me ask you something. When it, because I, there is definitely a pattern here yeah. about yeah. what was the thought? What was the thinking? Money in hand now? Yeah, definitely. More definitely. so than some time out in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was it. I, and I'll say a couple of those times, uh, there have been times where it's I'm in survival mode, right? I've got a child. I've got a house. I've got bills I've got to pay. These are decisions I need to make for today. Yes. Right? So it's hard to say if you have a car, a car house and major repairs to me. I'm a single parent. I have been the the sole person taking care of my daughter her entire life. I don't get child support, never got child support. I do not get help. It's just me. I also bought a house um, maybe a year, six months into working at Home Depot. So, you know, I, by the time I stopped working there, it was like, oh, I got to collect this uh, unemployment. And I got to collect this stock money and I got to take this 401k. I want to make sure that I'm taken care of, right? But I will say, while I feel like I was in survival mode, there was a time where I wasn't. And had I made the right decisions, I would not have had to make decisions out of survival mode. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. when I was getting a paycheck, if I had been putting money away into savings, if I had built that emergency fund, we all hear people talk about when the time came, I could have said, you know what? I'm gonna let those that stock sit there. You know what I'm gonna, let? I'm gonna let my four hundred one k sit there and give myself three six months before I have to make that decision, or I feel like yes. I have to make that decision. Yes. You see what I'm saying? And so a lot of these things that people are talking to us about, <laughs> it's I mean it, it it is real. Well, I, this is a conversation I have with my oldest daughter, who is a single parent of three children, mm -hmm. who bought a house two years ago. And I keep saying things like, your house is going to need a new roof. You're not going to want to come off that money in one. You're not going to be able to. So I'm like, just save a little bit. And this is, uh, Shawnee, I think, has voiced a very common opinion. We just don't have enough money to save. And I would argue anything if it's $5. So I'll say, can I say this to Shawnee? Yes. Shawnee, one of the things I, I appreciate you saying that because I've definitely been in places where I felt like that. I have not always made a lot of money. Um, 
I felt myself getting teary eyed because I remember being, I remember not making a lot of money. And I remember being a single mom and wondering, you know, how am I going to make sure that my daughter eats? Like, it's not just about being frivolous and wanting to buy nice shoes and wanting to take trips, but like, how do I make sure I feed my kid? I distinctly remember one day coming to work and stressed out because I didn't have enough money to get food. I was in college and I was working full time and I had a baby and someone had mentioned to me weeks before that, that they were going to give me the rest of their baby food because their baby was going on to solids. And this particular day I was stressed out and I came to work and that day she remembered to bring me the food. You know what I'm saying? So I know what that feels like to feel like you don't have enough money to save. And so one of the things that I love is Digit. The reason I love Digit is because Digit will prove to you that a little bit goes, a little bit starts to stack up. So if you haven't heard of Digit, it's this cool little app that you connect to your bank account and it looks at your average daily balance and it takes out just little bits that you can afford and it puts it away for you. Where you and, don't even notice it. And you don't even notice it because here's the difference between you and Digit. You aren't going to put away 23 cents on a Tuesday and 31 cents on a Wednesday and 19 cents on a, on a Thursday, but Digit will. And that 23 cents, 30 cents, 19 cents will start to add up before you know it, without you even noticing. And if you are concerned about Digit taking out too much, you can set limits and say, Digit, do not take more than $10 out of my account because I need all my money because I got to buy baby food. You know what I'm saying? So Digit will prove to you that you actually do have enough to save something. And I will encourage you, if I could go back and do Libria again 19 years ago, if Digit existed at that time, I totally would have done that. I totally would have started to put myself in a position where I had a little something so that I wouldn't have another day like coming to the office stressed out about how I'm going to feed my kid. And thankfully, someone gave me some baby food. You know what I'm saying? So I get how you feel, Shani. Um, and I, I I just wanted to, you said you'll try Digit. Good, 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 good. Try it uh, out. Try I'm it out for 30 days, see how it goes. 60 days, see how it goes. And I... I am a firm, y'all, I ain't have no money. I ain't make no money, okay? So I am a firm believer in a little bit. So something like Digit, like you said, it'll take out six, six cents here, 23 cents here. And then when you remember to check it, you'll look up and be like, oh my gosh, there's $600 here. And you didn't have to do anything. And the same is true when it comes to investing. Um, I think like, is this Laila? Yeah. Uh, said that you think it has to be a big amount. Y'all, I opened my Fidelity account the other day. I ain't looked at it in I don't know how long. And I'm not going to tell y'all how much red was in there. But I still bought $2 worth of stock <laughs> simply because I'm, the price is lower today than it was six months ago. Yeah. Even if it's $2. If I invest that and I leave it alone, it's going to be more than $2. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have all these apps now that allow you to buy fractional shares of stocks, fractional shares of REITs, of real yeah. estate investment uh, trusts, real estate investment trusts. So there's, I, I think that there's been such change in the financial industry where it's no longer for rich people. It's no longer just for people with big bucks to put in. They've completely de democratized it and made it available to pretty much everybody, yes. which I think is really cool. I, during the pandemic, um, during the pandemic, I keep, we keep saying that. We it's still, not over. We're still in it. No, we're still so, there. The beginning of the pandemic, uh, during quarantine is what I should say. During quarantine, I started investing in airlines and I didn't put a lot of money into it. I think I like put $50 into American Airlines and like $50 into Delta. Um, and I came back and put a little bit more and I actually made money off of it, right? Because I just put a little bit. And I had that mentality too. And I'm glad somebody pointed that out because I don't think that mentality just applies to investing. I think sometimes that mentality applies to saving. If I don't have a hundred, five hundred, a thousand dollars put in savings, like I what am I saving for? Put a dollar in, put five dollars in, just put something in there because you the minute you realize that I'm out of gas and I need to put gas in my car and you're like, oh, I have $10 in savings. I can put some gas in my car, right? That $10 is a whole lot then. Right. 
I'm telling you, even if it's $5 every pay period, even if it's $10 every pay period, because I've been in that position too, where I got to figure out how I'm going to put gas in my car, where I got to go inside and be like, can I get $3.23 in gas? I have been there. Or when you're like, I only have $5 of available credit on my credit card, but I'm going to swipe it at the gas station. And if it approves it, I'm going to just fill my tank up. And now my credit card is going to be over the balance. I've done that too. You know what I'm saying? I Trust me, I've been in survival mode. Put $5 away. But a lot of people think that if I don't have $500 or $1,000 to put in savings, I'm not going to put anything. Put something. If I don't have $1,000, $10,000 to invest, I shouldn't invest. Invest something. I And I, I caught myself doing this with a debt, actually, too. I'm trying to pay off debt. That's one of my goals. And there was this one uh, consumer loan that I have that I only owe like $2,500. I only owe. I owe $2,500 left on it. And I was ready to pay it off. But something came up, my daughter's car broke down or something, I need to help her out, right? And so now I don't have the 2,500 anymore. <laughs> and I think I had, I think I ended up with 2,000, with 500 left. And I was like, okay, I guess I just won't pay this off. Like, why wouldn't I put the 500 towards it? Like, what are you doing? It's, I, it's, have, I, don't, I don't quite understand where that thinking comes from, but- There's no logic. How it is how yeah. we as humans, for the most part, are wired, yeah. um, and it's it's often to our detriment. Now, okay, you've you've kind of had the whole range of jobs where you didn't make a lot of money. Then you then you got the bag, um, and I did not know this before. You helped people sign up for and understand their four hundred one k. I, you didn't know this either. I used to want to be a financial girl. Like I used to want to be, I used to say the black Susie Orman, but thanks to my girl, Tiffany, yeah. I don't know how to say that anymore. I used to want to be who Tiffany Budget Nista is today. Like during college, I would study a lot about, you know, finance and I, I wanted to be good at this. So I'm kind of like the shopaholic, like I'm terrible myself, but like I can tell people what they're supposed to do. Oh, well, that's I know what I'm that's, supposed to do. That's that's how it always is. You can see everybody else is much better than you can see it for yourself. Yeah. Okay. So now that I know this about you, I really have to know once you got in a place where you were not in survival mode, why weren't you, why weren't you contributing to retirement or it's because I, I heard you say, you know, like I would do the minimum to get the match. Yeah. Because if y'all don't know, with a 401k, basically you can set aside about $19,500 pre-tax. So you lower your taxable income for this mm -hmm. year. And that money then grows tax deferred until you're over 59 and a half, mas o menos, and you take it out. So... Like you, you knew better, I, but I, I won't putting, deny that. <laughs> putting that money there was not a priority. You, no, no, no. I always put it there. I've actually always contributed to my 401k. I've you always just took it out something to my 401k. I have never just not contributed to my 401k, even if it's just a hundred dollars. Like I'm putting okay. something in my 401k. Um, I just have always taken it out. So unfortunately, it hasn't grown, right? So at this point in my life, I should have well over, I should probably have half a million dollars in a 401k at least, at least at this point in my life. Having worked at companies with 401ks for 19 years, yeah, I should have over half a million at least. That's a minimum, right? Um, but unfortunately, I've taken it out, taken it out, taken it out. Um, and... Even in the height of the quarantine, I actually had to take a, some of it out to help my business um, because I had a travel business at the time. And we had, unfortunately, we had to cancel a trip and our we wanted to give our people their money back, but our vendors didn't want to give us the money back. So we had to make up the difference. So I ended up taking some money out of my 401k to, to, to cover that. Um, no so thought it, of doing a PPP loan instead? Well, we didn't have employees. Okay. So, yeah. Um, no. And I wasn't about to fake Listen, I, I wasn't trying to end up to be one of these stories <laughs> we have now with the PPP loan. So we we did do we did do, they had a disaster loan as well. So okay. we did do that, but it wasn't enough to cover it. So I just took some money out. It wasn't wasn't you know all of it, but all that to say, I have absolutely always contributed to 401k, um, and I'm excited that 
this year was the first year I ever maxed out my 401k. Yay. And I fully plan to max it out next year as well. Um, I think, I think hearing you say that, that it's twofold. It's not just that you have to contribute. Yeah. You also got to leave money alone. You got to leave it alone. Yeah. And, and that not doing that is very detrimental. Um, one of the things that I, I think allows me to be where I am now is uh, a lot of what we are told, particularly as mothers, is you supposed to sacrifice everything for your children. And one of the things we're supposed to do, because it's America, everybody's supposed to go to college. So you're, you're told about how you're supposed to save for college, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people I, a lot of people I talk to choose to save for their child's college and not their retirement. And I don't that's, think that's, right, that's backwards. I think it's because, backwards too. I mean, again. But I got, I, I, I commented on that in some financial group. I was like, uh, no, I only have X amount of years to put money aside for me. I was like, I told my kids straight up, this is how much money there is. We can cash flow this. Like you work, I work, we contribute. But there were a lot of moms in that group that were like, how could you not? Oh my God. I'm going to tell and you. And I like, was like, girl, girl Susie I'm not trying to say. work for you. I'm going to tell you like my girl Susie Army used to say, there are no scholarships for retirement. There are no None. student loans for retirement. Period. Like our kids have options. We don't. No. Our kids have options. We do not. And I think, you know, putting money away for college is also a tax strategy as well, because there are programs where you could contribute to that. But that's above and beyond you making sure you're doing what you're supposed to do for yeah. retirement. That's I'm I'm with you. That is my stance. I'm also a child whose mother was like, you going to college and I'm not paying for it. So get your grades well, right. <laughs> at, at, least, at least you got warning. Like I yeah. got the acceptance letters and this little teeny tiny scholarship. And I looked at home, I'm about to call my mama homegirl. I looked at homegirl and she was like, oh yeah, by the way, there's no money. Yeah. And I was like, what? Luckily, the University of Houston came through with a full oh, nice. scholarship which is why I went, but I was like, this would have been helpful to know before now. Well, my mom was not playing. She, cause so one, she insisted I go to college. Like I didn't even know I had a choice and not from a standpoint of being pressured. Like I thought that was the next thing I was supposed to do. And she made me start looking for scholarships in around the 10th grade. Um, oh, real quick. I want to address this question. I wish I had my links ready. Cause I actually have some affiliate links I could get y'all for digit and for what I'm about to tell you who has money sitting in savings that is not earning anything. So by anything, I don't know what you mean, but there are some savings accounts right now that are over I 2%. I mean, my ally is over ally 2%. Is over 2 Girl, you got that email. Yeah. <laughs> They've been going up and up and up and up. And it's such a, a change lot. because previously the emails pretty, were pretty, like, it was pretty, like, pretty. oh, we're, we're lowering it again. We're lowering it again. But yeah, yeah a, a recession will do that. It'll yeah. drive interest rates up. And if, if, you're if there is no money, time to save, now is it. Now is the time. Now is really it. Um, and so what we're talking about is Ally Bank. I'm sure you guys have heard of it if you have been following my girl, Adelia. Um, but they're an online bank and they have literally been raising their interest rates almost every two weeks for the last three months. And now it's over, it's 2.10%. Um, I just started banking with SoFi. So there's this 2% on savings and checking. Ooh. Ooh. And checking. So That's normally I wouldn't say like leave money sitting in a checking account, like move that to where it's going to earn more. But SoFi has 2% on, on savings and checking. So I just open an account there. Okay. Um, I don't, I actually don't know how old you are, but I'm assuming we are roughly. I have no problem telling you. I am 44 years old, which okay. is why I was like, oh, so crap. I'm a, I'm a little bit older than you. Yeah. Um, and I, I've, there's more and more people who are getting to be about this age. You, you look around and you're like, especially if you don't like want to work forever, you start to contemplate like, what will retirement look like for yeah. me? When am I going to retire? That's a big thing because yeah. when I was younger, I knew retirement was something that happened way in the future. But then 
when I had had my fill of everything in September of 2016, I start pulling out them calculators. And I was like, when, 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 do, <laughs> when do, when can I retire? Blah, blah, blah. And I, I wasn't enthusiastic about the numbers it gave me. Yeah. And I had been all fire had been on my radar mm -hmm. and fire financial independence retire early mm -hmm. i didn't necessarily see myself as retiring early but i did want to be able to retire yeah and so um i'm finding a lot of people get to about 40 and that's when they start to look around and kind of come across that and you mentioned not here but you mentioned to me that you think you you kind of missed the boat on fire oh, i did i missed the fire boat not necessarily I mean, technically, right? So no. I feel like all the, I feel like all the no. fire people are like in their 30s. And it's like, once no. you're 40, you're supposed okay. to retire, no? <laughs> okay, I think because early is relative. Yeah. If yeah, you look true. at what the U.S. government considers to be retirement age, that's like 67. 65, 65. Um, so yeah. if it's before then, technically it's early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, when I moved to Honduras and then I thought about like, Maybe I'm just done working. And I started looking at the numbers. I was like, I might be a fire person. Like, how the hell is that possible for somebody who never made more than $60,000 a year mm -hmm. and didn't start investing till probably about 10 years ago? So I would say you may not have missed early retirement. Oh, no, no. I, I think I was being dramatic. Okay. For sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, like, what... When you think about retirement, because we're here having this conversation, because yeah. you're like, mm, I don't, I don't really have the money to retire, or I don't have as much money as I probably should. When you envision what your retirement would look like, what, 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 what is the image in your your mind? So I will say, prior to reading um, "Smart Women Finish Rich," I don't think I really had a vision of retirement. Um, and not saying that I I didn't think I would retire or anything like that. It's just not something I thought about. You know what I mean? I don't know how to explain this, but this is, it, it, it was this abstract time period in life that was not in my view yet, right? It's not in my periphery yet at all. And so I hadn't really thought about it. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't picture myself as a retired person, if that makes sense. Okay. And I, I read Smart Women Finish Rich. Actually, I started thinking more about retirement when we were, when we got back from our year abroad. So I took a group of people around the world for a year, my daughter included, in 2016. We came back in 2017. And when I got back, I was like, when she graduates from high school, I want to quote unquote retire. And I didn't necessarily mean retire from working, but I meant retire from working in the same way. And I think my view of retirement is the same now. Um, I think I always want to make contributions in some way and use my skills and, you know, brain and, and be challenged. But um, when I got back in the U.S., my thought was, well, when she graduates from high school, I really just want to be able to decide where I am, where I want to be at any given time decide what, what days I want to work and what work I want to do. That's what retirement looks like. For yes. Me. So I, I don't mean that I just want to kick back and sure, I will kick back I think, on the I think and drink. for but. most people, <laughs> that's what retirement yeah. means. It is that um, their time is their own to do with as they choose, yeah. not like I'm going to go out and sit on the porch kind of a thing. Yeah, and, I'm, not know, gonna, I'm not going to shut peas and yeah, and no, spirituals. No. I will do that a couple of days here and there, you know, big okay. up to my granny. <laughs> but that's not the plan. I mean, like my mother is retired. Um, my mother retired the same month my daughter graduated and the same month that I moved here. So we all had big things. And she started working as a consultant afterwards. And she could have just chilled on her retirement because she worked for the federal government. So she got a pension. And my father... My father is in the army. My dad is in the army. So he also got a pension. Um, I don't know if that's here or there. Sorry about that. No, it's here. It's okay. Here. So um, 
So both of my parents have a pension, so they're set. And my mom, I think she and I are alike. Like, I think I will always be working in some sort of way. Um, but I, I love that she gets to decide, like, eh, I think I'll pick up this contract. Yeah. <laughs> and she can choose like, you know what? I would rather be traveling for the next three months. I'm not going to take that contract. I yeah, don't she's not going to do that because do... my daddy not going anywhere. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we, we spent some time on the mistakes that you made. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, they say the first step to recovery is, is recognizing that you have a problem. So I am curious as to what like woke you up and made you realize, Hey, I got to get my shit together. So <clears throat> I'm going to go back to reading smart women finish rich was definitely an eye opener. And I've read a lot of finance books and I feel like sometimes you need, and I, I've again, been studying personal finance for a long time, but sometimes you need messages to be reiterated over time, right? And sometimes you need a message to hit you at the, a message you've heard at before, right even time. if you've heard before, to hit you at the right time. And so now I just turned 44 on Sunday, right? And so reading that book, you know, at this point in my life was like, oh crap, like retirement isn't that far away. Like the actual retirement age isn't that far away. I'm way behind. And so one of the things that I did after reading that book was I sat down and built this um, financial goals template. And I think before I did this, my financial goals were very abstract. Like, I think a lot of people's are like, oh, I want to be debt free. And oh, I want to. But what does that mean? Yeah. But how, what that mean? how long are you planning to take to do that? How <laughs> much do you because people talk about want to be debt free, but they can't tell you how much they're how much actually they in have, debt. Right. So people say, I want to be debt free or I want to be able to live in such and such or I want to be able to do this. And so for some reason, after I read that book, I felt very compelled to be super specific about my goals. And I, I'd be happy to share this template with anybody that wants it. But I created this template that basically listed out um, short term and long term goals, one year, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And I listed super specific goals like pay off credit card. Debt. Uh oh, Sorry. <laughs> you're good. Pay off credit card debt. Um, one of my goals was take my mom and my daughter on a Mother's Day trip. One of my goals is to buy a duplex. And I put how much they are. Here's where it got really, really good. I wrote down what value, like what is it that I value in life that this goal is going to help me reach? Because that's the why, right? You got to know the yeah. why. So paying off debt is going to help me accomplish what that relates to my values. And freedom is it. Yeah. <laughs> And the second thing I put in there is, why is this feasible? Like I had to justify. I'm not just throwing. Well, no, because I'm not just going to throw goals up there. That's like, what well, takes it from being a dream. Yep. To actually, this is the plan. This is yeah. this is how I'm going to make this happen. Yeah. So I started with, why is this feasible? From a standpoint of, why do you think you can do this? Is it because you're getting a bonus? And this bonus covers this amount. Is it because you are redirecting funds? And then the next thing I put in there was the strategy. What specifically are you doing to make this happen? Right. And so once I did that, I promise you, it felt like the clouds parted. And I had a very, very clear view of exactly what I'm trying to accomplish. And even better, I had a clear view of how the things that I do today affect the goals that I have five years from now, 10 years from now. Because one of some of those goals are things like, one of the goals was um, in 15 years, I want to have a house that's fully, fully paid off, right? But in order to do that, I know that, that that's 15 years, right? Yes. And, and most, most loans, uh, home loans are 30 years, right? So that means I've got to start now freeing up enough money to make extra mortgage payments. Or get a 15 year mortgage. Or get a 15 year mortgage, right? One or the other. But the point is, like, I can see how these goals that I have way down here in 10 years, 15 years are impacted by the decisions that I'm making today because a lot of those goals feed the lower goals, right? Yes. So, for instance, one of them is to buy an international property, right? But one of my goals in the next year is to house hack. And the money that I save having to spend on housing will go towards that. Right. So it, it all it all flows together. And when I tell you that exercise, I have never felt so excited about my financial goals 
because oh, I, I read the book and it was talking about financial goals. And I was like, I kind of feel like my financial goals are like in the sky somewhere. They're just very abstract. It's, it's amazing how powerful it is to actually do something as simple as writing them out and what you did by linking them to your values. Mm -hmm. That, that is the most important piece. Okay. Now, Glass Half Full asked about this because I did want you to kind of talk about in the time that we have left, some of the things that you did or planning to do in order to make up for the past mistakes that we're leaving in the past. We're not harping on those, but what are some of those things? And you mentioned house hacking. Um, and I will say this, that if I had it all to do over again, house hacking would be the only way I would own real estate. So I'm now trying to play catch up, right? We've all, you know, all this boils down to, I made a whole lot of bad decisions and had some bad habits that I was not able to cover up by making more money, right? And my bad habits just got more expensive. And so now I need to play catch up. And two things that you can do to improve your situation is to make more money or reduce your expenses. Or, or right? do both at the same time. And that is my goal. My goal has always been to do both. And so some of the things that I've done on the increasing income side is one, always asking for raises. I, I don't wait for anybody to give me a raise. I am going to ask you for a raise. <clears throat> um, when are we getting raises? I am expecting a raise. <laughs> what do I need to do to get a raise? Those kind of conversations. My year, my one year eval isn't until May. I am already talking to my boss. What do I need to do? And I think now, that goes back to what we were saying before about talking about money. Yeah. Because I think for the most part, we've kind of been like, well, you hope to get a raise, not mm -hmm. what are you doing to make that happen? Yep. Who are you talking to? Who are you asking about that? Yeah. So one of the things I did was I moved into a role where I get bigger bonuses. So my bonuses used to be a percent of my salary. My bonuses now are a percent of my por my project portfolio. So whatever we charge clients, I get a percentage of that. So that was one way I increased my income. The second is, I'm going to get to house hacking in just a minute. Um, the second is I always ask for raises, right? The third way is because I work remotely, I can use this extra time that I'm not spending and wasting driving to an office or hanging out in an office looking busy. I use this extra time to create ways to make money, right? So I have a YouTube, just like my girl here. Um, I make money doing Instagram reels. I have a digital course. I have digital assets that I can sell while I'm sleeping. I do collaborative marketing with other companies where um, if I if people sign up for their courses or sign up for their things, I get paid doing that. Right. And so I think working remotely, one of the things that people sleep on, one of the benefits people sleep on is working remotely frees up a lot of time that you can use to invest in a side hustle, a business, all, all kinds of things like that. So that's another way to increase income. So there's that. Um, and then on the lowering expenses side. I thought moving my daughter out was going to be helpful for that, <laughs> but so far it has not been. So far it has not been, but you know, obviously cutting down on frivolous expenses. And and I'll be honest, I think finance is behavioral, right? We can't cut out things that no, make us happy. That's the biggest piece of yeah. it. It, it yeah. is behavioral. We can't cut out things that just make us happy. Like I kept trying to tell myself I'm going to stop getting my nails done. It's become something that I love doing. I love people asking me on Instagram, like, did you let me see these new nails? Right. I love sharing this. You don't have to deprive yourself, no, y'all. No. no. And and quite frankly, when you do that, whether it's finance or a diet, you it doesn't it doesn't work well. If you're unhappy, it's not going to work well. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not going to stick to it. And so obviously there's decreasing expenses. And so when my daughter moved out, my thought was what is one of the biggest ways I can decrease expenses, right? And start saving up more money and freeing up more money to, to save and play catch up. And so my next move is, actually one thing I want to mention is I used the Tulsa remote money. I got paid $10,000 and moved to Tulsa remote. I used that to buy a house. So my next move is to rent this house out. This will become my first rental property. And I am going to buy a duplex or multifamily home and live in one one apartment and have my uh, other ones have the other apartments rented out, and that will cover the the mortgage. The goal that's, is to cover the that's mortgage. That's house hacking. That's house hacking. So house hacking is basically you setting yourself up to live for free. 
So let's say I buy a place where the mortgage is a thousand a month and I can rent one side out for twelve hundred. Not only am I not paying rent or mortgage, I'm earning another two hundred dollars. And so that is my next goal, because that is going to be a huge improvement in um, that's going to be a huge decrease in monthly expenses for all of us. Our biggest expense is where we live. Right. Our biggest expense is where we live. And so my goal will be to house hack. If I cannot do that, then I will leave the country. Um, either do a tiny house because tiny houses don't cost a lot or I'll leave the country. Leaving the country is something I would love to do uh, as a number one option because I didn't even want to come back <laughs> to the U.S. <laughs> the only reason why it's not the number one option is because living in a duplex is free. Yeah. Right. So I would rather have the free option then, versus leaving the country. And y'all, you can house hack even in a single family home. Yeah. Yeah. That's some people can have, you know, they set aside a bedroom that they rent and use that money to pay toward the mortgage. It doesn't have to be a multifamily property. Yeah. But again, if I had it to do all over again, that would be the way that I did it. Um, anything else? Actually, one of my friends is doing that. She she bought a house a little while ago. She read How to Smart Women Finish Rich. She and I talk about this book all the time. And she just posted that she's renting out one of the rooms in her place. I would do that. Um, I just really don't want roommates. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, no, I, I understand. She's that. a youngin. She can do that. But the other thing I'm doing is I'm getting this house ready to rent out. Even if I don't rent it out, like outright, I travel a lot. So I want to get it ready to put on Airbnb when I'm not here. Right. So when I'm not in the city, when I'm in Atlanta or when I'm when I come to Mexico City and hang out with y'all, I want this place to be available for rent on Airbnb so that I can make money when I'm not here. This was not planned at all. But several of the strategies that Libria has mentioned are going to be discussed at next week's Exodus Summit 2022, which is all about ways to generate move abroad monies, sabbatical money, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are watching this and you don't have your ticket, this this is this is my affiliate link. So if you want to help your girl out and buy your ticket, please feel free. It is linked below in the description. Um, like I said, we, we ain't playing that. But I, I can't like not say that you can learn many of these things in more detail at Exodus Summit next week. Yeah, and I'm, um, I'm speaking at Exodus Summit too. About oh, that's right. I'm just... Yeah, about okay. remote work. And speaking of remote work, Livria is about to leave us because she has her own live on her YouTube channel uh, where she is going to be answering questions specific to remote work. And I just put a link in the chat. So when you finish here, you go over to Libria's page, this is the link, and then you can ask her all of your questions about remote work. You can come to Exodus Summit next week to attend Libria's session about remote work. Yep. Um, we have a few minutes though, so can, okay. do you mind if I answer some of these questions I see? Go for it, go for okay. it. So someone asked, what is Tulsa Remote? Tulsa Remote is a program that incentivizes people who work remotely to come and live in Tulsa for one year and in exchange for $10,000 and uh, access to co-working space for a year, as well as an amazing community that they uh, build around you, um, build and nurture around you. And if you rent here, they will pay you the $10,000. They will break it up into monthly payments. Um, but if you purchase a home, they will give you the full 10000 or whatever's left over of it uh, when you close. I actually purchased a house before I even moved here. So I think like a week after I moved here, <laughs> I had my $10,000, which is great. So I basically re reimbursed myself for my down payment and my house, my house purchase costs. Um, and I had planned on renting it out a while ago, like way before. But it turns out I have some... Um, some plumbing work that needs to be done. So I've actually got to replace the plumbing. I'm getting it done this weekend. <laughs> uh, so I just kind of never got around to getting the place ready. Um, but I'm really excited about getting it ready to rent out now because I'm ready to move on and do something different. Um, so that's what Tulsa Remote is. Somebody asked, 
So if you rent your rooms out, are y'all sharing the living spaces? Yes. If you rent a room out in your home, someone else is sharing the living space. So if that's not something you're down for, then don't. But don't like, do it. <laughs> some people who have like a big game room space upstairs, like some people, the upstairs is where the renter is. They stay downstairs. Some people will rent the master suite. Yeah. And they live in the upstairs. It, there are multiple ways of yeah. doing it. Yeah. And if like, if you have a basement or something, you can set up your basement to be a whole apartment. Um, somebody said, uh, don't forget you have to pay. Someone mentioned that they had a bad experience with a renter, so they didn't do it anymore. I wouldn't let that deter you. Um, you know, bad experiences may happen, right? But they may not. There's not a guarantee that every time you rent out, it's going to be a bad experience that, I mean, it may or may not happen. Right. Um, so I wouldn't let that deter you from the experience completely. And homeownership and, and real estate is one of the best ways to build wealth in this country. It has always been, it will continue to be. Um, someone said, don't forget, you have to pay taxes on rent. Um, uh, not yeah. pass it's, it's, it's passive income and it's taxed differently. Yeah. And you, a lot of people that are real estate investors, they don't purchase under them. They, they, they build businesses to buy yes. places with. So um, it's a business. I it would also say, don't let the tail wag the dog. Yeah. Trying to avoid paying taxes is not a reason not to do something that can make you money. There are ways yeah. to mitigate taxes. And the, the great thing about real estate investment is it's an, it's an, it's income multiple ways, right? So it can be rental income, it can be rental income. Um, you can make money on the sale of it. But if it's rental income, you also build equity in the home as it appreciates as well. So that's that's a dual benefit. And I think the benefits far outweigh taxes and possible bad renters. To be honest. Um, somebody said this country is too expensive. Facts. Big facts. Uh, I think I hit all the questions that I saw. And if you guys want to join me over at I'm my YouTube, we can link. continue this. I'm happy to answer more questions. And I did promise a couple of things. So um, Adelia, I'll send you a link to that spreadsheet. I'll have to sanitize okay. it and take all my business out of it. <laughs> I'll leave a few, I will leave a few examples in there um, because again, I'm a very transparent person, so I don't mind sharing. Um, I'll leave a few examples in there so that you can see kind of how I was thinking and how you can utilize it but I'd be happy to share that spreadsheet, that uh, financial goal spreadsheet uh, okay. with folks. Okay. So uh, Libria needs to go over to her YouTube channel. I just posted the link in the chat. You can join her over there, talk about remote work, probably talk about Tulsa Remote and, yeah. and get some we of your questions. talk about this too. This is fun. I, I thank you for inviting me to talk about something other than remote work because- I'm a multidimensional person and I wouldn't even mind coming back and doing an update. I think, I think we want to do that. I think yeah. so. Tell I you guys how so. I'm doing, where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll check in again. Absolutely. Yeah, thank, you. thank you so much for coming to hang out with us and for being just, thank you for everything. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thank you. This was super fun. Super fun. It was. It was. All right. Nice to meet you guys. And hopefully I'll see you over on my YouTube. Let's let's keep this yeah. let's keep this part going. Y'all go ahead over there. Um, oh, I meant to post this. Simi is in Antigua, thanks to you. I saw that. I, I don't if you watch the replay, you see the moment that I saw that. Because I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. That is amazing. I would love to talk to you more about that. Okay. Simi, All right. Now we've we've already made you three minutes late. So yeah. All right. I don't want to hold you up anymore. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you guys so much. Um, if you are interested specifically in remote work, because I know that that is the primary topic that she's going to be talking about over there tonight. She does a monthly Q&A uh, about remote work. Or you can come to, if you are a Black woman, you can come to Exodus Summit uh next week can y'all believe exodus summit is in one week uh and find out how to make your move abroad money uh even if even if you're not gonna move abroad because i'm a i'm gonna tell you i'm sure y'all can hear me uh, walking across the room um 
I, I sent my daughter a ticket who just got her, her job is going to let her work from home. And I was like, Hey, there's an event next week and it's going to be all these different ways that you can make money. Cause I am, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, like keep her from making the mistakes I made or having to learn the things the hard way that, that I did. You know, so even if you're not going to move abroad or you don't you don't know, you're not sure um, all of the sessions, the vast majority of the sessions uh, will be beneficial to you, even if there is not a move abroad in your immediate future. Um, I'm trying to think what else I need to tell y'all um, in the description of this that was the wrong button. In the description of this video, I have a link to Libria's YouTube page, as well as her Quick Commuting Academy, where you can find all the work she does helping people to quit commuting. Um, if you are not on the waiting list for the Get Started Investing Challenge, it starts in 18 days. It starts in 18 days, I think. Um, there's a link below in the description for you to get on the waiting list um, so that you will be the first to know when registration is open and you can get your, your reserve your spot at the lowest price. I'm trying to think if there is anything else I was meaning to talk to y'all about. I think this is it. Today is Wednesday. Uh, we will probably go live to discuss my my dating life if, if there is such a thing uh maybe monday i don't know we'll see but sometime next week you'll get your part two thank you all for coming to hang out now please go over to uh libria's youtube channel and enjoy the rest of your wednesday bye guys